There's an old story of a Greek warrior's voyage home from the Trojan War, whose path led him and his men to the island of Sicily, where they would become trapped in the cave of a giant cannibalistic cyclops, which began eating the Greeks alive, one at a time. After passing out in a drunken stupor, the soldiers jabbed a sharpened log into the eye of the giant, blinding him. As the men fled to the safety of their vessel, the cyclops, named Polyphemus, called out to his father, Poseidon, to curse the Greek leader, Odysseus, and ensure that his voyage home would be one filled with horrors and plagued by loss. But another story unfolded here long before, before the Trojan War, before Greek stories of Cyclopses, before Greeks. At first, the setting for this story might not seem so unusual. On any normal day, the smell of salty sea air blowing in from the impassable surrounding waters would have loomed heavily across the island. You'd see cranes wading through ponds, you'd see tall swans marching on in patrol of their territory, and you'd see giant tortoises grazing on grass. You'd hear the croaks of frogs while the songs of some 50 bird species would chime in the heavy heat, and you'd be surprised to hear the trumpeting calls of wandering parades of elephants. You'd barely notice that an island in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea is an odd place to see such creatures, because you'd be distracted by the fact that these plodding animals were no taller than your hip, because these were the smallest elephants there ever were. And it was here, alongside the other residents of this hidden world, their island home of Sicily, over half a million years ago, that was the setting for one of evolution's most bizarre of spells. The first hints from this vanished world were unearthed in a different time, by another species, living in a different world. It was 1859, when an English survey ship landed on the little island of Malta, just south of the Italian island of Sicily. Thomas Spratt wasn't just the captain of the vessel, he was also a skilled geologist, and it was while exploring the island's caves that he would find small, elephantine bones. He brought the collection of fossils to Hugh Falconer, a brilliant Scottish naturalist who announced the existence of dwarf elephants to the world when he presented his study of their teeth a few years later. But after dying from complications of his heart and lungs, it was left to an equally brilliant British scientist, George Busk, to take over the collection of fossils. Busk went on to publish a more detailed study of the remains in 1867, where he confirmed that they were indeed the bones of small elephants, but among them were three distinct size classes. Each of them, he believed, were separate species of pygmy elephants. Smallest of all were a few minute molars, which formed the basis of a species which he classified closely to the Asian elephant, while naming it after his fallen colleague, Elephus falconeri. As the years ticked away, not much was made of the miniature elephants of Malta. Some new finds trickled in, but even a century after they were first found, little was known about them, and nothing in the way of skulls had ever been seen. But that changed in 1958, when a young scientist in eastern Sicily with a fondness for caves returned from an underground chamber carrying with him a set of bones that, when pieced together, formed a skull a skull that was far older than the ancient Greek artifacts that archaeologist Bernoubo Brie was used to studying, but still managed to correctly identify as belonging to a very small elephant. After hearing the news, paleontologists wasted no time planning an excavation. After all, at the time, all that was known of the pygmy race were a handful of bones and teeth. After two years of digging at the site, called Spinigallo Cave, they had collected 3,000 bones from 104 individual elephants. In 1962, exactly 100 years after Hugh Falconer first presented his work on the elephant teeth from Malta, they announced their find. Among the most prized specimens were several skulls, some of which were near perfectly intact, as seen in their paper. In all, six skeletons were assembled, four of which were put on display at the University of Rome. But pygmy elephants weren't the only thing found in Spinigallo Cave. Not far from the bones of Elephus falconeri were extinct species that have also been found on nearby Malta, because 600,000 years ago, the two islands were attached by a strip of land, conjoining them as one. Giant dormice, twice the size of living ones. Tiny teeth and bones from dwarf hippopotamuses. Fragile pieces 
of an extinct sort of oversized swan. The existence of these oddly sized animals are directly a result of their isolated environment, particularly a principle called the island rule, which comes in two extremes. On one hand, it has the power to take large animals and reduce their size drastically, a phenomenon known as insular dwarfism. On the other side of the extreme, it's been known to cause insular gigantism, whereby usually small animals can balloon to a much greater mass. Traditionally, the reasoning behind it is simple. Compared to the mainland, islands tend to have a much more limited food supply, typically not enough to sustain hordes of multi-ton herbivores. So when groups of large animals end up trapped in an island environment, the evolutionary pressure to survive on less food intensifies. Given enough time in isolation, perhaps many thousands of generations, they adapt to the conditions and their body mass slowly shrinks. And as in the case of the elephants buried in Spinigallo Cave, the change can be severe, shrinking them to a mere 2% of their ancestors' original size. And in the case of the Spinigallo elephants, their ancestors were huge. Early on, it was suggested that the pygmies evolved from some living elephant species, but it was the giant Paleoloxodon that could be found roaming Europe and Asia 800,000 years ago. In the east, the 24-ton Goliath, Paleoloxodon namiticus reigned, but it was the European species, Paleoloxodon antiquus, or the straight-tusked elephant, from which the dwarfs of Sicily and Malta would emerge. During the Earth's unstable climate, in a time called the Pleistocene Epoch, when sea levels would ebb and flow as glaciers crept further and further south in a series of ice ages, you'd find elephant numbers drifting south in search of warmer conditions, as land sprang up between the sea, closing the gap between the mainland and the island of Sicily. The intervening space would have shrunk to a swimmable distance. While most meat-eating mammals and big herbivores aren't so eager to swim any long distances, the rodents, hippopotamuses, and straight-tusked elephants of southern Europe would have had no trouble reaching Sicily by swimming a few miles or paddling across a marshy land bridge. But when the sea levels would eventually rise again, and when the shallow land bridges would sink beneath the waves, the continental immigrants became trapped, and the island rule went into full swing. More recent research, though, seems to show that the island rule isn't so much of a rule as it is an occasional pattern, with many exceptions. The shrinking of the straight-tusked elephants probably had less to do with food supply and more to do with the fact that once on Sicily, they were living in a strange, unbalanced ecosystem, free of competition and predators. With no other large herbivores to compete with, being the dominant browsers on the landscape was no longer an edge, and without any carnivores to worry about, their bulk wasn't required to defend themselves. And this lack of predators meant that the rodents of the island could step into the open, fully able to forage for food safely, eventually leading to the giant dormice, Leithia melitensis. While the fossil elephants of Spinigallo Cave are beautifully preserved, not a single one of the 104 individuals is known from a complete skeleton. Instead, the specimens in Rome are composites, made up of multiple individuals to create a finished display piece. So when a pair of Italian paleontologists published a new analysis on the species in 2015, covering their anatomy, growth, lifespan, and life appearance, it gave us our closest ever look into the lives of these animals. The most surprising thing they discovered is just how massive these tiny elephants were. An elephant calf born on the Serengeti today that stands 95 centimeters tall will weigh something like 120 kilograms, but a bull Paleoloxodon falconeri, just as tall, weighed a hefty 300 kilograms, curved tusks and all, giving it a body mass 240% greater than an elephant calf of the same height. Standing 80 centimeters above the ground, tuskless females weighed about half as much, while a newborn was so small it could have stared a pigeon in the eye. Size wasn't the only thing different from their straight-tusked ancestors. Their 98% size reduction left them with more babyish proportions. They were stockier, more broad creatures, with an elongated and wide torso, carried by shorter, stubby forelimbs. While the straight-tusked elephants they came from had thick, sturdy skulls, the pygmies' larger, more infantile skulls left a vast space inside their heads to fill. As a result, in the new paper, the authors explained that their brains were probably extremely large, their numbers on par with the brain mass of dolphins. 
They also put forward the idea that since staying warm would be difficult for such little animals, they had to conserve heat wherever possible. Perhaps they had evolved smaller ears, or even a shaggy coat of fur to stay warm. The Pleistocene of Sicily was probably the only time in history when the local birds were taller than the elephants. Cygnus falconeri were the biggest swans that ever lived. Their island environment prompted the species to grow to be more than two meters long. At that size, even its immense three-meter wingspan probably wasn't enough to get it into the air. While the sky teemed with flocks of little birds, the great swans could be found mostly on the ground, amongst a variety of frogs, toads, and lizards, all of which still exist today, and a giant tortoise that is no longer, a miniature hippopotamus now long gone, and of course, the overgrown and ever-present dormice. Together, this combination of animals, both big and small, both extinct and modern, would have made for a most spectacular of little worlds, an evolutionary stage with a cast of characters, each just as weird and wonderful as the next. But all things must come to an end. Nobody is sure how or when the islanders vanished, but as we know well, planet Earth was an unpredictable place at the time, and all things, especially a fragile community of odd island-dwelling beasts, were vulnerable to extinction. But the end of the giant swans and pygmy elephants wasn't the end of Sicily's island worlds. Remember, George Busk described multiple species of mini elephants found buried in distant Maltese caves. Scientists now believe that over hundreds of thousands of years, there were no less than three separate waves of straight-tusked elephants that reached Sicily and shrank down to dwarf status. And while none were as small as those from Spinigallo Cave, the life of Paleoloxodon falconeri was only a chapter in a long series of migrations and extinctions of the colonizers and the colonized. But Europe's straight-tusked elephant didn't just give rise to the dwarfs of Sicily and Malta. In fact, the Mediterranean islands are brimming with their fossils. From Cyprus and Crete to the Greek Cyclades and Doodecanese islands, the unmistakable traces of miniature elephants have been recovered. Each population, representing entirely unique species, separate offshoots from their straight-tusked mainland forebears. But distinctive fossils found on the island of Crete prove that the island was once home to another race of elephants entirely. As early as three and a half million years ago, long before the pygmy elephants of Sicily and Malta, at least some of the Mediterranean islands were once home to mini mammoths, the smallest of their kind. Over vast stretches of time, the Mediterranean was filled with perhaps hundreds of little worlds, each with their own mixture of immigrants and natives, all of them separate from the evolutionary sagas unfolding across the continents they were sandwiched between. According to the epic story by the Greek poet Homer, Odysseus's voyage home was filled with horrors and plagued by loss. But before the drunk Cyclops had fallen asleep, he asked Odysseus his name, to which he responded, My name is Nobody. While most of the fanciful inhabitants of the Mediterranean had already succumbed to extinction before humans colonized the islands, to the last populations of dwarfed beasts, like the pygmy hippos, eking out a meager existence on the island of Cyprus, an invasive species arriving not by swimming or crossing any land bridge, but by boat, would have seemed like nobodies. After all, they lived for many thousands of years without any predators, and had no reason to fear humans. And they, as well as the last of the island worlds, were snuffed out unable to cope with the dogs and other foreign beasts that the invaders brought with them. Ultimately, the people who would come to inhabit these islands, as well as the mainland of Italy and Greece, would flourish into some of the most influential cultures in history. They would develop the most amazing of art and philosophy, and plant the seeds for modern thinking. And they would write epic stories, of gods and great wars, of strange creatures and man-eating cyclopses. But through it all, they would never fully realize the true wonders of the places they inherited, the skeletal traces of which were buried all around them, hidden in the caves where their children played, or poking out of rocks in the quarries they dug to build their cities. Even when strange bones of animals unrecognizable to anything they were used to were inevitably found, they couldn't have known that they belonged to lost worlds, populated by beings just as remarkable as the ones that graced their stories. But though these charming island inhabitants have faded long ago, their memory hasn't, 
We've started to unravel these enchanting worlds more fully than ever, revealing their true colors, both big and small. Almost as if, even today, on some remote corner of Sicily or Malta, you could still hear the trumpeting calls of tiny elephants playing in the mud of their local waterhole, alongside the giant flightless swans vigilantly guarding their territory, while giant tortoises graze and the songs of some 50 bird species chime in the heavy heat. Polyphemus was the son of Poseidon, and in a way, so were the remarkable island dwellers of the Mediterranean, because if it weren't for the impassable, watery borders surrounding their secluded patch of earth, they never would have been. But to those early settlers, who had never seen an elephant before, it must have been so strange, stumbling upon large, vaguely human-like skulls hidden deep inside caves, but in hindsight, their interpretation made a lot of sense. <laughs> 